the amount of problems that are caused by overventilating with a bag valve mask is insane. And for a long, long time, we always thought maybe the more the better. And then suddenly this information came to me while I'm sitting in this auditorium. And then the first thing that you think is, oh my God, have I ever done that to someone? And that feels terrible. So I'm sitting in the dark hearing this and I raised my hand. I said, well, what's the solution? And the instructor said, well, stop doing that. Overventilation is a known problem that can have many negative downstream physiologic effects. Conversely, underventilation is also a known physiologic problem. So there's a very difficult balance between the two. Today, we have a special, fun, bonus episode for you. I'm going to briefly discuss some data and attach a few papers for you to review if you want more information, but this is not an educational episode. This is more of a how I built this episode, emergency medical device style. Will and I met just a fantastically wonderful inventor of a device called the VT Select. She had such a fun personality and an incredible story for how she got her device off the ground that we thought, you know, our listeners might really enjoy hearing this story as well. Who knows, maybe it will spark an entrepreneurial bug in one of you as well. This episode is not about advertising or selling this device. If I'm being honest, I don't know if it works. And what I mean by that is I don't know if it will actually lead to positive patient-centered outcomes. What I will say is it's a really innovative device that attempts to solve a challenge in EMS with the goal of leading to better patient outcomes. Time and research will tell if it succeeds. Before we talk about the device itself, let's talk about the problem and why it's such a difficult problem to solve. Bag valve mask ventilation. What are the optimal volumes? What are the optimal rates? The truth is we actually don't know what the optimal values are. Part of the reason for that is the lack of feedback on ventilations performed in out of hospital cardiac arrest make it an incredibly challenging topic to study. We can measure rate to some degree of accuracy, But aside from the rate, it's just hard to measure accurate tidal volumes or inspiratory or expiratory times in real world pre-hospital settings. So we actually have very little real world data on different strategies and how they affect patient outcomes. Most all of the recommendations are expert opinion that rely heavily on laboratory and animal studies without a good understanding of how this translates to the real world and real patient-oriented outcomes. For example, the study that set the optimal rate of 10 to 12 breaths per minute actually came from a porcelain pig model in which they ventilated a pig in cardiac arrest at a rate of 30 times per minute and a rate of 12 times per minute and found improved outcomes in the 12 times per minute. Follow-up real-world research found no difference in cardiac arrests ventilated with more than 12 times per minute or less than 12 times per minute with the majority of providers in that study ventilating at a rate of 15 to 16 times per minute. Similarly, a study that looked at volunteers ventilating a mannequin with a pediatric BBM versus an adult BBM found that the mannequins ventilated with the pediatric BBM received more ideal tidal volumes, but then a follow-up real-world before and after study looked at a single EMS system that made the switch from standard size BVMs to all small BVMs, and they actually found a lower survival after making the switch to a smaller BVM. So multiple animal studies have shown decreased cerebral perfusion pressure and cardiac filling with overventilation. They've also shown similar detriments with underventilation, which is also complicated by increased pulmonary vascular resistance and decreased CO2 clearance leading to worsening acidosis. Physiologically, we know there's a sweet spot. If we find a way to consistently hit that sweet spot in real world situations, this should theoretically lead to an improvement in patient outcomes. I say theoretically because honestly, patients don't care if you fixed a bunch of physiologic numbers. They ultimately care if they survive and have a good neurologic outcome. And sometimes those things, physiologic numbers and patient-centered outcomes, don't jive together despite our best understandings of the science. 
So now that we have a better understanding of the problem and the murkiness of the water we're about to wade into, let's get to the fun stuff. Come hear the wild roller coaster ride of how Bobby Sue, her husband, and her best friend bet their life savings on trying to solve a real world problem in hopes to save lives. Here you on eight. Here you on eight. Okay, you're clear. Stand by for your base. Welcome to EMS Cast, where we provide high-level education for you, the providers on the streets. We're on site at Fast 24 here again, and we have a special guest who is here showing off a product she designed. And so she's going to come on and tell us about this product. I think it's something that seems needed, and we'll talk about why. But uh, can you just tell listeners who you are? And Yeah, I'm Bobby Sue McCullum. I'm an emergency nurse out of the Portland, Oregon metro area. And I invented Palmodyne Intersurgical's VT Select, which is a bag valve mask that controls for rate and volume to prevent hyperventilation. Tell us, where did you come up with this idea? Well, first, I have to give a shout out to my hometown because when I was in fifth grade, they had an invention convention. And literally, that changed the way I thought about problems. And so when I was very young, I was like, I am going to be an inventor. And so I was always solving problems. Most of the things had already been invented or it was like, why would anyone listen to me when I live in Nebraska and I say I have the best shark repellent in town? (laughs) (laughs) But when I came across the problem of hyperventilation during resuscitation, I was like, I understand this problem well, and I am an emergency nurse who has the background to get people to listen and I went for it. So to get in the weeds a little bit, what were you seeing? Were you seeing people ventilate at too fast of a rate or squeezing the bag too hard? Well, I saw those things, but I hadn't come across the information that that was a problem yet. And when I went to get my ACLS renewal, they started talking about how we were killing people that were trying to save by overventilating them. And Tell us more about that. What, What is the problem? So the problem is, basically, we're putting too much air in too quickly with bag valve masks. And studies, depending on which study you look at, 60 to 100 percent of the time, we like we as a medical, like all of us across the country. Collective field. Yes, a collective. We're doing that. And essentially, the lungs are getting so big, they only have so much space before they hit the ribs. Then they start to take up the space that the heart needs to refill. So we're strangling the heart with the lungs or we're, you know, popping the lungs. We're causing gastric insufflation, causing ARDS, all sorts of problems. Like the amount of problems that are caused by overventilating with a bag valve mask is insane. And for a long, long time, we always thought maybe the more the better. And then suddenly this information came to me while I'm sitting in this auditorium. And then the first thing that you think is, oh, my God, have I ever done that to someone? And that feels terrible. So I'm sitting in the dark hearing this and I raised my hand. I said, well, what's the solution? And the instructor said, well, stop doing that. Right. (laughs) When you're super stressed (laughs) and it's really hard to slow down. Just Slow don't down. do that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, it's right. funny because I immediately was like, well, the reason it's happening is all the adrenaline. I mean, someone's dying in front of you and no matter how much experience you have, you're still getting that adrenaline rush, which warps time. Like a second feels like a minute. How are you supposed to accurately count that out? And let's be fair. Who's looking at a clock? Who's accurately counting? Who's watching a flashing light and getting it right? It's not happening. That's why those studies were showing us that there was something wrong and we need to reevaluate the problem. Honestly, though, literally, I felt like I had been given a gift. (laughs) I walked out of that class and I had this field of energy that I could feel around my body. And I knew that I was going to solve the problem. And my goal was to solve it in a very cheap way. So that even if the bag was like in a developing nation, that they would be able to afford it. And I'm not Y2K compliant, so I wanted it to be low tech (laughs) (laughs) and just intuitive. And when I was driving home, 
I was thinking about how is this actually going down? Like, why, why is this problem happening in the emergency department? And I'm just envisioning what I have seen in the past. And with the p- people squeezing quickly, again, because of the adrenaline. And I thought, I need the bag to tell me what to do. How did the initial idea come for what ended up being the product? I was driving home from that class. And as I'm working through this in my mind, I thought if the bag could be delayed in such a way that when it fully reinflates, I can feel that it is time to squeeze again, then I will get the rate down. So I actually had the valve figured out before I even got home. It took me a little bit longer to realize what now feels so obvious, that where you squeeze the bag really matters and that I could find reliable points to get specified volumes out because you have to solve for the volume output as well as the rate so that you can make them work in harmony together. So it took me a little bit longer to figure that out, but I'm telling you on that ride home, I got the delay part figured out. I walked in the door and I told my husband, I was like, I have an idea. And he was like, what? And I said, I want to invent this bag valve mask that controls rate and volume. And uh, I'm going to delay the refill so that upon reinflation, I can feel when it's time to squeeze again. And I still have to figure out the volume part, but I'm going to do it. And interesting background, that one. He's like (laughs) fly by the seat of his pants. He's like, yeah, you should do that. (laughs) <laughs> and um, he really meant it. He cashed in his retirement, as did I. And my best friend was like, I think that's a good idea. Don't put that on your credit card. I will invest and we will start a company together. So so kind of jumping ahead, because if we have a listener, they can't see it. Tell us the end result, what the user experience is of okay. the product. And then maybe we can get into some of how it does that. So it is a tactile feedback system built in to a bag valve mask. So what you'll see is that there is a valve on the back and on the VT Select, there's two selections. You can do standard mode, which allows you to use the bag more like a regular bag that you're used to, or the activated setting. So it comes out of its bag in the activated setting. So if you just leave it alone... When you put your fingers on the grip points and squeeze until your fingers touch, you will get approximately 500 milliliters out to the patient, which is the average adult volume. When you release, the valve causes a delayed refill. And upon full reinflation, you can feel that it is time to squeeze again and you will get approximately 10 breaths per minute. Yeah. So if you haven't seen this, basically, Picture a standard bag valve mask, but on the the part that you grip and squeeze, there are some ridges built in that give your fingers a natural rest point. And so what you do is you squeeze the bag until those ridges touch in the middle, which limits the volume you're delivering. Mm-hmm. And then when you release your hand, the bag doesn't just pop back to its inflated natural setting. It slowly reinflates at a, and I'm saying slowly, but it's a a very specific speed so that you can't just squeeze it right away again. Yeah. It's pretty ingenious. Thank you. So, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it solves a problem that we all know exists, which is overventilating. And then most of us now know it's a problem and this is a fix for it, which is great. I also love the story of how you got this off the ground. Can you tell us that story? Oh, yes. It is a long story. I'll try to just give you the high points <laughs> yeah. because the story. Uh, you decided took, pretty quickly that you thought a valve in the back of the BVM would help. Yes. So it began that day when I was in class. And by the time I got home, I had figured that portion out. It would be a little bit longer before I had a chance to squeeze a bag with a feedback mannequin and realize that I could find those reliable pressure points to get specific volumes out. But like any good story, there were major ups and downs. And (laughs) the first challenge, honestly, was I had to prove to myself that I understood the physics of what was happening in a bag and that it was worth my time and money to move forward. 
So I got a Dremel and a sacrificial bag that I completely took apart to make sure it was all one-way airflow, which it is. So there's one-way valves naturally through every bag valve mask. So then I was like, how do I manufacture a plastic valve at home as a regular person sitting in my dining room? And I went to the crafty store and I had no idea. I was just like hoping to be inspired. And I walked down the aisle where sculptors get supplies and there was this kit where you could make molds. And I was like, oh gosh, if I could just build the piece that I want out of like a thin foam, like almost like foam paper onto the part that I cut off of the back valve that twisted on. I should be able to make a mold and pour resin in it. And so I bought those things and I went home and I cut up that foam and made what I wanted. And I knew it was going to be rough. It was going to be only to prove concept. And it absolutely worked. I mean, it didn't have the right timing exactly, but it showed me like this will work. And from there, I took the bag because I had found specific points to get the specified volumes. And then with a 3D printer, I had someone print out little labels of different volumes and I knew where to glue those on. And then I could get the specified volume out. So that was pretty much how I made the prototype. But once I made the prototype, then it was like, now what I do? (laughs) Yeah, you got to sell it, right? Yeah. So how do you go about trying to sell it? Oh, well, I wasn't even too apart. Did you just bring it to work? Like, look, I made a thing. So what happened was I was at at work one day and I was like, I have no idea. What do you do when you have an invention? And the CEO of the company walked by and I said, hey, I have this invention. And he goes, what's your invention? I said, well, step into my office. And I took him in the trauma bay and I went over the whole problem. And then I showed him a bag and I told him what I was going to do. And it turns out, if you have an idea, and every inventor beware, your employer has probably got some policy that says that they own your idea. Mm. And at the time, I didn't even care. I was like, that's fine. I have no idea what I'm doing anyway. And he said, well, you'll go meet with these people, and they'll go over your thing, and we'll see what we're going to do. Well, at the end of the day, they met with me and got a lawyer who went over it and came back and said, you have to patent this right away. This is a great idea. We couldn't find anything else like it. And the company didn't actually have a way to develop it. And so I was going to have to do all these things. And it wasn't really, it's like part of my job to do that. So nobody knew what to do with that. And it sounded like I wasn't going to get paid for it. So I got a lawyer who wrote out a term sheet. And then I got a little messy with (laughs) them getting upset at me. And they said, here's a letter. You can just have your invention. We don't know what to do anyway with all of this. And I was told that the direct quote was, if it was a good idea, someone else would have thought of it. <laughs> oh. Which, burn, yeah. Yeah. Well, who's someone else? <laughs> that, was, that was kind of a low point. I wasn't sure if I should move forward. So there are no good ideas left in the world then is what you're saying. I guess so. Everything saying. that yeah, can yeah. be invented uh, yeah. has okay. been invented. Right. That, they actually, uh, I don't know, who. someone tried to close the patent office. Yes, uh, in, in the, the late in, 1800s. Yeah, yeah. said there's nothing left to invent. <laughs> wow. That was before sci-fi even came yeah. around. Yeah. <laughs> so that was when my best friend said, I'm going to invest with you and we're going to start this business. And so we did that. And another sister-in-law, sort of not married, but basically she's my sister-in-law. She shows up at my house. She's a stay-at-home mom. She said, we need to make a video to raise funds for you. And so we decide we're going to do this crowdfunding. Well, we make this incredible video and for like no budget at all. And we post it. And that crowdfunding made very little. But the weird thing that happened was I got discovered by Hollywood. (laughs) 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 And I got this email from a show. And they were like, we would like you to audition for the show. And then I ended up getting on this show. And I don't know if I can say the name of the show. That's okay. You don't have to. But it is a... It's a show that's on television and yeah. it centers around ideas and inventions. Yes. We hadn't made it to the point where we had a working prototype. So the show actually made a working prototype 
We tested it with EMTs on mannequins. And then I pitched to an investor who ultimately rejects me. And I was devastated because, <laughs> you know, okay, now I'm two down, right? Yeah. Like I've been rejected twice now. And I didn't know again at the end of that. It was like, okay, well, maybe someone will see it on TV and they'll be like, hey, that is a good idea. And it did open doors for me because for some reason, if you are in a reality show, people take you more seriously, which it should <laughs> not work like that. It should not work like that. <laughs> so then I ended up cold calling all of these companies and I was just reaching out to different people in my network, um, which was kind of small, to be honest. But luckily, I, my friend Jeff Beer, he is this paramedic in my region of the country, and he knew a lot of people. And so he thought it was a great idea and had connected me with some other people. We were getting the word out. I was meeting with companies. Sometimes it would look like it was going to happen and then it would fall through. And it was just like this up and down. I mean, it was very dramatic. And we went through $100,000. Okay, we're just regular people. <laughs> and we went through $100,000, which we had accepted from the beginning. Like, this probably won't work, but this is something that should exist and it would benefit people and it will be a great adventure. And so even though we had done all that and accepted the reality, this probably won't work. I was motivated by the fact that I had used my best friend's money and I had to get Sarah her money back. And just the fact that it should exist. This should exist because why are we hurting people we're trying to save? And so as we're literally almost out of money, Jeff says to me, you can't stop. You have to go to this major EMS conference and show anyone who will listen um, and he specifically said, and find Dr. Ducanto, he'll help you. <laughs> you know, the guy, the salad guy. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, well, do you know him? And he goes, no, I just yes. heard he's a nice guy and he's an inventor. I've so, seen this movie, The yeah. Prophecy, <laughs> go find Ducanto. I know, it was. It was like, out of this sea of people, I'm going to go try to find Dr. Ducanto. So we get to the conference. We could not afford a booth. The booths were thousands of dollars. It was in Vegas, so we got cheap tickets to Vegas. And I have a friend who maybe gambles more than would be advised, <laughs> but she got us free hotel rooms because she's a diamond well, member. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we were there on the cheap anyway. And we get to the conference hall and somebody says to us, hey, you need to be really careful because there's a lot of security right now. The shootings had just happened in Vegas. And if they find out that you're showing something you didn't pay to show, they're going to kick you out. And then we were like, oh, my God, we've come so far and we cannot get kicked out. So we shoved the prototype into the bottom of our backpack and we were like watching all the security to see which one was doing their job the least well. <laughs> <laughs> and then we went through that line whilst Sarah, who's so charming, chatted the person up and I was just like, you know, trying to be casual. And we got in. And once we were in there, we got a little ways from the door and we just pulled that thing out. Anyone who would listen, started telling them about it, kind of started creating this buzz amongst the attendees, they were like going to get their friends to come see what we had, even though it was just a prototype. And then we were hitting all the companies and it felt really exciting because there was all these new people we could be rejected by. <laughs> 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 and so went over to this booth and this guy says, he goes, you know, he's going to show me his stuff. And I said, OK, I'll let you pitch me, but then I get to pitch you. And he said, OK. And I'm not sure about that. And I said, well, I have the next big thing in resuscitation. He goes, everybody says that. And I said, well, I'm not lying. And he let me pitch him. And he goes, well, my God, you do have the next big thing in nice. resuscitation. Then he goes, that guy over there is Dr. Ducanto. You should go show him. <laughs> oh, and I was wow, like, that good? The Dr. prophecy Ducanto? comes. Uh, okay, I have to go. And we went and we met Dr. Ducanto. 
And he, he was very nice. He was incredibly approachable. I just went up. I'm Bobby Sue. I invented this. I showed him the whole thing. And then he said, ah, I need a minute. I'm going to have to think about this. And I was like, okay. And, you know, I gave him my, I think it was my Twitter handle. He's like, I'll contact you. And I was like, okay, like maybe he will, maybe he won't, right? Anyway, it wasn't later that day, I get a message back from him and he said, you did it. You solved the problem. And he invited me to go show it with him at this thing that he was doing there. But I got the message too late. The thing was over with. Oh, no. I know. It's such a bummer. But because he really believed that I'd solved the problem, he introduced me to a small company who was looking to expand their product line. And that company ultimately introduced me to Pulmodyne, who was actually looking to solve this exact problem. And they said, hey, we want you to work with them. We want this to succeed. We think they could do it with you. So the first time I got on the phone with Pulmodyne, it was so weird because I had been rejected so many times That when I had a phone call that was just like, it was almost like it was a done deal already and that we were definitely doing this, that I literally couldn't comprehend it. (laughs) I got off the phone and my husband was like, well, how did it go? And I was like, I don't really understand what's happening. (laughs) It just sounded like they they wanted to do it. They didn't say no. Nice. So we ended up getting a licensing deal with Pulmodyne and then Pulmodyne got bought by Inner Surgical, and now Inner Surgical has taken the product worldwide, except Which for, for any EMS providers out there, Inner Surgical makes the eye gel. Yes. So you can pair the VT Select with the eye gel and uh, you don't, I guess I don't want to put, I don't want to yeah. put ventilators out of business, <laughs> yeah. but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> nice. Well, that's amazing. And that's the summary of eight years. <laughs> eight wow. years. Wow. wow. Yeah. Eight years of hard work and an overnight success is what they say. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I love your story because it's relatable to anyone that takes care of patients in these environments. We all identify things we want to see change or different or think, oh, man, if only my piece of equipment could do this or that or function this way. And I think it's cool that you tackled that. So kudos. And also, what would you say to anybody that sees a problem they want to tackle? I feel like this has been the truly one of the greatest adventures of my life. And if you see a problem, I guess the first things that I think to be really reasonable, because I think you do have to also be reasonable beyond your excitement, is that you should, A, write your entire idea down. Then you should search the U.S. patent website because you can actually just search patents that exist because it would be a real bummer (laughs) if you got pretty far into this and then realized, hey, someone else has this. And then if you truly have a unique idea that you should, I want to say be optimistic, but cautiously optimistic When you approach people, first of all, you only have so long once you publicly disclose it to put in a patent. I think you have a year. So either they have to sign something that says they won't talk about it or not. But you need to get feedback and be ready for real feedback. Like you have to be willing to accept if it's a good idea or a bad idea or that maybe your idea just needs some tweaking to become like something truly incredible. I think that is the smartest way to go about it. Because in no way do I mean to tell anyone like, oh, you have an idea. You could do all these crazy things. I It's so easy. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I know. People always tell me now, hey, Bobby, Sue, I got this idea. How about I just tell it to you and you make it? And I say, no, you can keep your idea. (laughs) All it takes is eight years and life savings. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, how frequently in billions of people on earth how frequently do you have a unique idea and you have to just be so realistic about all that but if you truly do and you've evaluated it and other people are like yes that is a good idea i think it was so worthwhile and i would have thought that even if it didn't work out the 
things that I got to do because of this. I mean, I was obviously discovered by Hollywood. That's pretty fun. Mm -hmm. Um, I got to travel all over the country with my best friend going to conferences and just, you know, trying to um, get the word out. And so we went on all these road trips. I saw most of the country. I've only not been to Hawaii. I've been to all the rest of the United States now. And for my kids to see that I was like working really hard on something that I was passionate about was really valuable for them. And they talk about it all the time. So that's really cool. Yeah. yeah, I just think it was a true gift to get to have this idea come to my mind. What's next for the bag? Are there any studies planned? We are open to partners because we would love to have a study. If anyone listening to this, like a field EMS provider is interested in demoing the bag, seeing the bag, I would imagine through Intersurgical or Pulmodyne's website, they could maybe get their hands on one. I think so. Yeah. I think we, if you contact our sales team, we could send out samples. Cool. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show and sharing your story. Well, thanks for having me. And I want to say one quick thing. This has been the hardest, most rewarding thing I've ever done, except for being a mom. That is so much harder and way more rewarding. (laughs) (laughs) Mic drop. I like it. (laughs) Thanks so much to Bobby Sue for sharing her incredible story with us and for having the courage to pursue her dream to bring a potentially game-changing resuscitation device to life despite all the ups and downs along the way. If you guys want to check out the device in more detail and see some pictures of it, you can go to pulmonine.com forward slash product forward slash BT select. We'll also put the link in the show notes in addition to links to the papers I discussed in the intro. We hope you enjoyed this bonus episode of EMS Cast, and we'll see you back next week for our regularly scheduled educational content. <laughs>